Shall we? Yeah, I think we can start. We. Um, and before we start with the presenters, I would like to give the floor to Milena because Milena was the section editor for uh, the handbook. And the chapters that are presented in this session are part of this handbook. So Milena, the floor is yours. Yes, many thanks, Martijn. And uh, yeah, just before we get started, I, I want to uh, um, thank Martijn uh, Hendricks and Martijn Burger for, for their um, um, actually for doing everything related to the GLO A Hero sessions this year. Due to my maternity leave, I haven't been able to do much. So um, yeah, so, so a round of applause to, 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 to both of you and thank you very much for, for taking the, the lead on this. Indeed, Martijn, uh, um, th this is a session uh, uh, featuring uh, several chapters from the Handbook of Labor, Human Resources and Population Economics, which is uh, published with Springer. The uh, editor-in-chief is Klaus Zimmermann. And I am the section editor for the uh, section on uh, well-being uh, and um, uh, happiness and welfare. And that section features 22 wonderful chapters. So most of them have been completed by now. Um, and the, the chapters are unique in the sense that they feature state-of-the-art uh, information on different topics. And the primary audience for these uh, um, chapters is uh, academics, such as ourselves, but also students. Or um, if, you, if you are teaching uh, a course on happiness economics or thinking about teaching a, a course on happiness economics, the uh, uh, handbook chapters um, can be very, very useful. Um, I have been using them in, in my teaching and I find them very, um, very appropriate for that purpose as well. So uh, today we actually will have, we have three presentations scheduled, but unfortunately uh, Martin Binder cannot join due to illness. So uh, we will have um, Olga um, Popova and Vladimir Otrachenko who will, um, so Olga will be presenting on their chapter on uh, religion and happiness. And then after that, we have uh, Clemens Hechko who has co-authored with Andreas Knab and Ronnie Schoep um, on, on happiness, work and identity. And then we also have um, presentations of uh, uh, the chapters in some of the GLO A Hero sessions tomorrow as well so stay tuned so without further ado uh, i would like to give the floor to to olga um, and hear her presentation many thanks okay thank you melina i think you should now be able to see my slides and now yes. turning it to, to the full screen yes so, yes, thank you. Thanks again for the invitation and for the opportunity to present this uh, chapter. This is probably the first time that when I'm presenting something that I have never presented before, but which is already published. And this is the chapter, uh, as uh, Mirena said, prepared for the Handbook of Labor, Human Resources and Population Economics. And this is the joint work with Vladimir Trashenko from the uh, Justus Liebig University Gießen. So what I will talk about in this chapter, this generally focuses and follows the structure of the, of the chapter. So I will first co cover the conceptual framework and the theoretical foundations that are lying behind the empirical work on, on this topic. Uh, then discuss the mechanisms, what can explain this relationship and also uh, talk uh, a bit more about so-called insurance effects and then go through uh, different aspects in empirical works that uh, are available now in the literature. And this is individual country level evidence, some empirical challenges and so on. So generally this, is, uh, this relationship between religion and happiness is quite a complex relationship. And uh, th this, is, this complexity comes from, from many aspects. Uh, starting first with really multidisciplinary nature, perhaps even more than in other uh, happiness uh, research. Uh, here with religion, uh, we have the sociological research uh, quite uh, developed, we have economics research, religious studies, 
and there are really different angles from which you could look into this topic. And on the top of that, there is, uh, of course, genuine interest in that uh, from coming from the philosophical spirit, whether this is uh, being religious or non-religious is a rational thing or not, uh, whether it derives some uh, um, emotional, uh, emotional well-being and how it shapes emotional well-being. And from the point of view of uh, uh, researcher, it is also quite difficult to model this relationship because you first to carefully think, have to carefully think about what is religion, how to measure religion. Uh, also not uh, saying that happiness is also the, the, uh, the term which is uh, in, in this particular chapter we uh, mean by happiness uh, both subjective well-being, life satisfaction, happiness uh, uh, questions, but in general uh, in the literature it is of course also distinguished between the, the different aspects of happiness. And since the literature on the topic is really quite broad, in the, in the chapter we focus specifically on the literature on economics and try to outline some of the main and key principles that uh, drive this relationship and what would explain this relationship between religion and happiness. And what is a good thing, uh, this relationship between religion and happiness is quite well uh, grounded in economic theories. There are several economic theories which we can outline that could uh, explain and help to explain why religion would affect happiness and well-being. One of the seminal papers on this is by Asian Ehrenberg, The Theory of Allocation of Time, where the authors talk about uh, why people become religious. And uh, the, the starting point here is that people, individuals derive utility from consumption during their life. This is the usual consumption we used to to have, but there is also the consumption in the afterlife. And the, basically the individual is uh, optimizing his behavior, his or her behavior based on uh, optimizing these two uh, types of consumptions. And this also motivates the, the person to allocate time to religious activities because uh, religious activities would uh, presumably give more of the afterlife, con afterlife consumption. And this is also, uh, a point that gives happiness. Uh, summarizing this theory, this, uh, the, basically the, the religion can be seen as a product of three components on all these three components basically imply the positive relationship between religiosity and religion and well-being. Uh, these are spirituality, collectivity and the meaning in life. Uh, spirituality would be some kind of emotional well-being, intimate relationship with religion and uh, basically deriving some, uh, some happiness uh, internally from being engaged in religious ritual. Uh, then collectivity implies largely being a part of the group and uh, the benefits associated with being the member of, the, of some social group in this uh, particular case, the member of particular religious denomination. And finally, there is also the meaning in life that is guided by religion because religion, uh, old religions, typically provide some guidance uh, and norms that would uh, guide the individual in their life and provide some more meaning and sense in the life. The second theory is uh, about rationality and uh, whether uh, the choice to become religious or non-religious is basically the choice uh, that uh, the individuals make based on their rational decisions of weighting costs and benefits. And here we could distinguish both the religious consumers, which would be uh, individuals who uh, evaluate their benefits and costs in participating in the religion and maximize their utility based on net benefits and costs. Uh, I will talk about these benefits and costs just, just in a minute. And there are also religious producers. Those are religious institutions, churches that also optimize their behavior. And if in, in, in the individual case, it's typically about the utility and the well-being. In case of religious producers, this uh, objective function is not always clear. Uh, it could be uh, the maximization of the number of adherents of a particular religion, but it could also be maximizing the number of donations 
or maximizing some gross religiousness or, or religiosity in some particular space. And they are, both of these uh, types of the actors are basically also constrained on their resources and on, on their um, uh, individual choices. The next theory, which is also relevant here, is, uh, is uh, seeing religion as a club. So here you see that religion provides the benefits and religion uh, uh, implies bearing some costs. Benefits here are wide ranging from the emotional engagement and social networking from, to the pro prospects of the afterlife. And in terms of costs, this is, uh, well, could be seen as a cost, but not necessarily cost uh, in, in a general sense. Uh, this is following some behavioral restrictions on religious norms, keeping some dietary restrictions or closing restrictions. And this uh, basically by weighting these benefits and costs, uh, the individual makes a choice of becoming religious. And basically the, the choice uh, is then if uh, the benefits out, outweigh the costs, uh, then it means that uh, uh, the individual derives some well-being out of, of being religious. So all these theories basically uh, provide an implication that the relationship between the, the happiness and the religiosity should be positive. Uh, here, in, when coming to a bit closely to empirical work, one should uh, really take care about the term and terminology because it, uh, sometimes it also implies different findings depending on how you look at the religion and religiosity. Uh, so there is religious affiliation, which would be the affiliation with particular religious denomination. And this is basically self-declared, usually the uh, self-declared affiliation with, with the religious denomination and adhering some particular norms. Then there is religiosity, which, is, which could be uh, measured also in very different ways. It could be uh, whether you uh, attend the religious services frequently, whether you believe in God, whether you consider yourself as a religious person, uh, do you think that the God is important in the life and, and so on. And typically when, when you see the empirical research on the topic, uh, in most cases, uh, what really drives well-being and happiness is religiosity. So the active engagement in religious activities, on actively believing, uh, but not the just the self-declared uh, religious affiliation. And then there is also some gross religiousness, which is typically taught about uh, in some gross terms, like a country or regional level averages of individual responses to religiosity. And uh, this is uh, used when you do the research on the country level. Uh, in terms of mechanisms, what could explain the relationship between uh, re religion and happiness, there are not that many studies in economics that uh, shed a light on this, but there are many studies, studies in psychology. And you could outline from the literature, you could outline three major channels. One is the social support, so basically uh, being, being a religious meaning, means being a member of the group and meaning that this also gives you more of the social contacts, more of the social networking. And we all know that the social uh, engagement and social networks help to shape, shape well-being. Uh, then there is the cognition and the perceived control. Uh, this is uh, the basically having the rules and norms guided by the, some particular religion provides you also with the, some sense of, uh, of, of the vision of the world and provides some meaning of, of, in life. When you having some meaning and purpose in life, this, is, uh, this helps to improve your well-being and you also are more happy in this case. And finally, uh, Religious people in, in many psychological studies are also shown to be uh, more positive in general. So they uh, experience more, more of the positive emotions. They uh, are more loving, more hoping. And they, they also having the uh, more positive behaviors like more frequently forgiving people or doing good deeds. And we know that all these, uh, these um, actions and emotions also uh, shape the well-being. 
So this is a major uh, three of the major channels that could explain this relationship, and uh, but but this are uh, basically driven from the from the psychological literature, not from economics. In economics, there are not that many studies that basically trying to deep uh, go deeper into explaining this relationship from the side why why it happened that religion would shape well being. And then there is also so-called insurance effects of religiosity, which means that uh, religious people are not only satisfied with their lives more, but also in case there is some stressful event happening, these people are um, suffering less. So let's say if there is uh, unemployment, the person was, uh, was laid off, then uh, we know that the, the implications for well-being are typically negative, but if you look into this from the perspective of the uh, religious person, this religious person would suffer from such event less. Uh, because the religion provides some stress buffer or some different norms and uh, helping to cope with, the, uh, with this negative situation. This effect was shown in very different context. In my previous research, I also looked into this, uh, this uh, effect from the side of aggregate events, so there are some economic reforms, so large scale changes in the economy. Uh, this also uh, helps to, if there are people uh, who are religious, for, for religious people, these are less stressful events. Uh, empirically, how it goes, it's usually the usual question of the subjective well being with the individual characteristics, where you include the religiosity, which typically has the positive effect uh, here. Then there is some stressor like uh, individual unemployment, so being uh, uh, laid off in, uh, in recently. And then you include the interaction term between the two. And uh, usually this thing is negative, but for the religious people, it is positive. So for the, the effect of unemployment, the negative effect of unemployment will be, will be uh, less pronounced for, for the religious people. And this uh, is studied in many different contexts uh, for divorces, for unemployment, for economic reforms, and different, really different contexts. Uh, in, the, in general, in the literature, uh, uh, there, there are some literature that uh, looking into particular religious denominations. Uh, we didn't summarize that part of the literature, but rather drawing the uh, overall conclusions, uh, because most of this literature basically shows that independently on religious denomination, if the person is uh, actively religious, this implies a strong positive relationship between the uh, happiness and life satisfaction uh, at the individual level, which is, is the left part of this graph. If we aggregate these responses to the country level, this is actually not the case. This was called by the, uh, as an aggregate uh, religiosity puzzle, that on the country level, uh, more, in most cases, we don't actually have this positive relationship. It is uh, usually, it is mildly positive, but usually not statistically uh, significant. Why it is the case? Uh, there are many explanations to that, starting from that religion generally on the country level uh, gives, uh, basically becomes less and less important given the development of the, of the world. So there are institutional developments. Uh, if historically religion played, say, much stronger role in providing social security and uh, helping uh, people in need, now more and more institutional development is happening and religion plays a uh, much uh, lower role uh, in, in general, especially in developed countries. Uh, also, this dimensioned insurance effect could play a role here. Uh, we would see that in uh, poorer countries generally face more problems with, uh, with different aspects, including poverty or inequality, but they are also more religious, while in developed countries they are facing less of the problems, but they are also less religious. So if you aggregate everything to the country level and to cross, do a cross-country analysis, that would on average mean uh, no relationship. And finally here, it is uh, in general quite difficult to isolate uh, the effect of religion from other country level factors like institutional development or 
even uh, GDP per capita, uh, because on the country level, this uh, is also quite mixed and it is uh, basically the role of the, of the religion becomes less pronounced. Uh, part of the problem could also lie in the comparability because when you aggregate the religious measures on the, on the uh, country level, it may not necessarily be comparable measure between the countries. And uh, given these measurement issues, uh, you may also get no relationship on the country level. We also looked into uh, global and regional perspectives, not from the point of view of different religious denominations, but rather from the point of view of how many research was uh, published on the topic in on using data from different regions. Uh, this, uh, if you Google it, uh, the science direct, has, uh, you would get some, something close to 4,000 articles. Uh, published over the last 20 years on the topic that would include the keywords uh, related to happiness and religion in different regions. This is uh, the picture here shows uh, how many researchers uh, independently of the discipline done uh, total number of articles published uh, using data from different regions. You see that uh, quite many of the research is done on, on Americas and on Europe. If you divide it by the number of countries in that region, then America would uh, be in stronger lead. And this is again, independently on the, on the research field because it is quite uh, uh, really uh, disper dispersed between different disciplines, uh, religious studies, psychology, sociology, uh, economics, and so on. So the, this relationship is uh, in general quite uh, well studied and many of the researchers shows the, that the relationship between religion and happiness is positive. There are some studies that show, uh, the, I think in the, in the sociology and in the religious studies showing that there, there could be also negative aspects of religion. Like for example, if there is a stressful event that is happening, then, uh, and this, if this stressful event is happening to a religious person, then uh, he or she may, be, may feel disappointed why, why bad things happen to me. And maybe this disappointment can lead to lower well-being. But in economics, actually, there are no cases that would show a negative relationship between the religion and well-being. It, it, it is usually a positive, strong positive relationship. Uh, or in the worst case, it is positive but not significant relationship. And here, uh, active religiosity also plays a role. So usually active engagement in religious uh, activities and being religious actively uh, means a positive effect on well-being, while uh, adherence and self-pronounced belonging to a particular religion usually pronounces a, a positive effect as well. But uh, this effect is usually less robust and may depend on particular religious denomination. Um, and there are, of course, empirical challenges to that, main of, uh, of it uh, related to indigeneity, because uh, unhappiness can also drive religiosity, and there are many cases showing that uh, if there are some problems in the life, uh, people become unhappy due to different stressful life events, adverse events, this can drive religiosity as well. So this is the, implying the, the reverse causality. Uh, then there is also, of course, self-selection. Uh, in, uh, in many cases, people are also able to choose whether they become religious or not become religious, or also choose particular religious denomination which they would like to adhere. And finally, there are also could be the problems with the omitted variables because particularly it is, would be difficult in some cases to distinguish between uh, uh, religion and culture. Uh, the, there are some solutions to indigeneity in the literature, uh, but this is still a developing uh, part of the of overall empirical work on this topic. Uh, some suggested solutions to uh, indigeneity problem in the literature uh, is, for example, identification via policy changes, like if uh, there are some drinking laws imposed, uh, these drinking laws would affect opportunity costs of being religious, and this would in turn may imply different behavior of religious non-religious people. 
in my previous research, I also used uh, historical instruments. Uh, I, I was studying the effect of uh, uh, religion in uh, post-communist countries. And uh, if you take the religiosity of people in that area in the before the communist times and the after communist times, these are still very, very related uh, instrument for, for the uh, contemporary religiosity because the other feature of this data is that the religion in general is a quite stable variable. It is not really changing in time. And finally, there is also some literature that exploits the variation in the timing of Ramadan, but this is of course limited only to one particular denomination and could not be applied to studying the effect of dif different uh, uh, religious affiliation. Uh, so what can be else done in this in this literature, given all these uh, aspects that I out outlined? Uh, we suggest that uh, more focus should be now done on the uh, exploring particular channels and in both individual level and maybe country level, like political institutional environment, because the uh, in the literature in economics is uh, actually quite low on explaining the channels, particular channels. Part of this is, of course, related to availability of the data, and uh, there are not always, um, it, it is in general difficult to find the instruments, but it is also very difficult to explain these, uh, these um, channels and mechanisms behind the relationship given the existing data. And relatedly here, uh, more of the work would be done using, for example, field experiments or using vignettes and maybe incorporate, incorporating more of psychological or behavioral questions and surveys. And finally, what we see as a very important thing is uh, looking into the more into the role of religion in economic policies that would shape well-being. Because if you look, for example, into the sustainable development goals, many of these uh, variables and the goals are actually also quite well affected by religion and we know that religion shapes well-being so uh, religion could actually be the uh, very helpful uh, variable and and in explaining and helping in promoting economic policies that would lead to sustainable development i will finish here and i will uh, be grateful for any comments and questions and that you have here is the a reference to the chapter where you could read more details about what I have just presented. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Um, so we have uh, 16 participants in this session, so I can imagine there will be some questions. Um, so you can yeah, raise your virtual hand if you want to ask a question, um, or you can put your question in the chat. And, the first question comes from Robin. Thank you, uh, Martin. And uh, thank you, Olga, for your presentation. I have a question uh, regarding um, your discussion of religion as an insurance. You were talking about negative life events and religion as a buffer. Um, is there any research that also um, looks at positive life events? Because I was thinking about denominations um, where pleasure is also condemned in some way, right? That the, the, the positive effects that these um, life events would have, are they also buffered? Is there any research on that? Can, uh, could you comment? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. Indeed, uh, yes, there are also positive events are also studied in this, uh, in this aspect, although a bit uh, less than the negative events. Examples that I could give is that uh, in my own research, I studied the effects of reforms, and reforms may also bring the, the positive effects, not necessarily negative effects. And in that case, uh, what, what the finding was that the re religion actually reinforces the effects of the positive effects. And I know there is also the research on marriage, I think. Uh, marriage is a positive event. And in that case, it is also uh, the same finding that religion reinforces the, the positive effect of the event. And uh, do you also know, or can you comment on how these um, reinforcement effects arise? Is it also through sharing the joy with the community? What is at work? Uh, 
in terms of mechanism, as I showed, this is quite the literature is quite underdeveloped in that because uh, well, usually when, when the people study that they usually provide too many some, some wordy explana explanations, but not really empirically test the channels behind this. So uh, yeah, in terms of just uh, some explanations. I think social networks play quite good, quite well, big role in this. But generally, empirically, it is not really studied why it, why it uh, happens. Okay, thank you. Okay, then I will ask a question. Um, so what really strikes me is this uh, secularization going on especially in Europe and the US while there is a positive effect of religiosity on happiness so yeah this is quite counterintuitive from a utility perspective so could you yeah reflect on that Olga when Generally, when people talk about the secularization theories, is uh, this is typically about the overall religiousness of the of the society. To what extent the, the overall religion is is spread in the country? While uh, generally, I think it is not really the case that people become less religious individually over time. Maybe there are some religious denominations are changing some become more important, some become less important, but overall the people still quite religious in many parts of the of the globe. While on the country level, indeed religion just institutionally plays a lo lower role, and this is part of the explanation that I provided uh, relating the individual and country level differences here. So the, on the country level, yes, the, the religion plays less lower and lower role. Because also social security systems are well developed by now, institutions are well developed by now, and this all these things uh, may be uh, on the country level would be more important than than, than religion. Hmm. Okay, let me see. We have. Um, yeah, we can do a question from the chat. Can you see the chat? Or you? Mm, yes. Yeah. Because Paul has sent a question via the chat, so maybe we can do that one. Uh, yeah, the, the, this could well be just a statistical statistical issue, also given the measurement issues that I outlined because of the, uh, specifically because of the comparability of cross-country data on the aggregate level on religiosity. And yeah, this could well be that uh, there are many measurement issues here. And Basically, uh, studying uh, uh, religion and, and happiness on the aggregate level is not quite common. When people look into the religion at the aggregate level, they typically relate it to economic development and uh, GDP and economic growth, but not really look into the aggregate well-being indicators. And this is usually, uh, th this is a more pronounced part of the literature that looks specifically on, on the some income indicators uh, no, rather than well-being and, and the country level. And in general, religion uh, could be seen more like an individual level variable because it because of its uh, yeah, intimate nature with the with, of the relationship. So I think uh, more and more explanations are basically feasible at the individual level, while at the country level, it's also quite difficult to explain this, this relationship. So it could be the, the statistical also issue here. And I, I totally agree on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. And we also have a comment of Lilian um, saying that basically we think that religiosity is declining, but people stay spiritual. Um, so that actually, at least in spirituality, is not really declining. Is that something you uh, agree with? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I would agree because uh, also, as I mentioned, uh, 
usually this relationship between the happiness and religion is uh, largely when you really actively engaged in religion, independently on religious denomination. So if it is about just spirituality, which is uh, not always could be related to any formal religion, this we would still find the positive relationship. And uh, uh, maybe looking into these specific aspects uh, is less pronounced in economic research, but I think in uh, psychological research it is also quite well discussed and to looked into. But generally mm -hmm. in, in economics, uh, these kind of spirituality issues would be captured by uh, the degree of your own religiosity and independently on the of the religious affiliation. Okay, and then I move to Eduardo, who has raised his hand. Hi, 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 Olga. What, what do you think about uh, a difference difference between religious process uh, and a spiritual process in life? Uh, I, I don't know if you remember uh, or you know uh, Martin Seligman idea about the spiritual person um, live with a more quality life. What do you think about difference? Uh, religious about the church and different kind of process and a spiritual process in, in people. Yeah, this is quite a philosophical question, I would say. Uh, generally, uh, yes, if you just let me, the, 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 this religion is, is a component of, of several things and uh, in, in particular in economics, I would not uh, really distinguish religiosity from spirituality, what is done in, in the economics literature. I see, of course, there are differences if you look into it from the perspective of different fields. But from the point of view of modeling and economics, uh, this is about the active engagement with uh, re religious rituals. And this may or may not be related to particular uh, religious denomination. So basically, religiosity and spirituality in economics research would, be, would mean the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. It's very interesting. Thank you. Mm. One more question I had is whether religious people are also less materialistic. Like that's my intuitive thought, but is that uh, something that has been shown and a possible mechanism between happiness and re religiosity or not? Yeah, this point is actually raised when explaining why the insurance effect of religiosity works. Because typically when the people study the stressful life events, they talk about the events that are in some sense related to, to income changes. And they say that uh, insurance effect uh, specifically works because uh, the religious people have also some additional norms that may not necessarily be related to, to income changes. And that's why the, it works for religious people. Then when some stressful event is coming. So yes, I agree this could be the part of the explanation on, on, in general of this effect. The, the, the relevant issue in, in this point is why suffer? Uh, I, I think that there are different kinds of religious people. Uh, I, I, I don't know why suffer if uh, with religion, the people is possible to uh, live with uh, sublimation process with quality life. I, I agree uh, with you uh, that it's possible that people uh, hard religious with the uh, hard uh, commitment with the uh, protocols religious suffer. But I don't I don't sure that that is a, a general general idea in people. Well, here it's maybe uh, about the wording because uh, generally the findings here they, they look into the uh, some adverse effects that would affect uh, an average person negatively. And, okay. Uh, for religious people, this is basically showing that the effects are not not that negative uh, and may even be positive for for religious people. Okay, so absolutely. This is yeah, just. I wording. understand. Okay. 
Um, maybe a final question. Um, so you show linear effects, but what does the literature show? Or can you also be too religious um, in terms of happiness that there's like a non-linear effect or not? Like I, I'm thinking about, yeah, some orthodox uh, religious streams that might actually be uh, counterproductive. Uh, yeah, yeah. Related to subjective well-being, I think it is not really well studied, but in general there are studies that look into the extreme religious values and, for example, looking into the uh, corporal punishments of children by uh, people of specific extreme religious beliefs or when you look into the health and uh, studying the implications for health when there are certain religious norms prohibit doing some of the medical treatments. So mm -hmm. in general, there are studies like that, but not really related to subjective well-being. And I agree that it would be also interesting to look into religion a bit more non-linearly, studying the degree of religiosity in, in a deeper way. Okay, thank you. Um, very interesting uh, chapter, Olga. So now we will move on to uh, Clemens. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Uh, yes. Very good. Yeah, I will also present a um, chapter in the same handbook. And um, the chapter is entitled Happiness, Work and Identity and is joint work with Andreas Knabe and Ronny Schöp. And the basic idea of this, of this chapter is that we, um, we basically proclaim a certain causal relationship here which is that work creates a sense of identity uh, and therefore also happiness. Uh, I have to ask you, do you see the presenter view or do you see the, just the slides as they are? We see presenter view, yeah. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to I have problem seeing my own slides. That's basically the problem. I can stop share and try to connect them again. Mm -hmm. So now I can see my own slides. That is hugely helpful. How about you? Yeah, we can see your slides. Okay, you could see my slides <laughs> all the yes. time, I know. Yes. Yeah, so again, yeah, so the basic idea of this chapter is this causal relationship that work creates a sense of identity and um, therefore uh, also creates happiness or produces happiness, which in theoretical terms we will call identity utility as one component of people's happiness. And two things should be said here. The first thing is what is identity and we will define identity as the alignment of people's ideal selves with what they um, what they actually achieve in life and what they do and um, this will be this will create this identity utility and by happiness we should also be more precise here and say that we mean uh, cognitive well-being and not necessarily experiential well-being or affective well-being. Yeah, because as we will see, this shows mainly in cognitive well-being, so something like life satisfaction. Okay, so in what follows, I will, I will build on social psychology and identity economics in, in order to provide a framework um, of identity utility that will allow us to accommodate many empirical findings uh, on the research of work and, and well-being. 
and this will be concentrated on a certain this framework will be concentrated on a certain identity utility function and in turn the loss of identity utility will uh, be a major reason why the unemployed uh, seem to suffer so much from from job loss and this is also the the, the empirical part of the presentation uh, where the empirical evidence will come from in order to support our claim that you know work is to some extent instrumental uh, to people's identity and to achieving their ideal selves and then i will turn to labor market policy uh, and argue that a labor market policy will only be able to alleviate the misery of the unemployed if uh, the policies are able to restore people's identity utility and we'll briefly talk about two examples where labor market policies fail to do so. And then there's something we do not do in this chapter and I think it would be um, would be really really interesting would have been really interesting to to uh, talk more about this is and this is the identity utility from different job types such as self-employment or clerical work uh, and I think other examples come to mind here too but there is really a lack of so to speak hard empirical evidence uh, on how different job types could be instrumental to people's identity um, as well. Um, and this will also become a direction for future re research uh, in, at the end of the talk, of course. So as I said, I start from foundations from social psychology and here in particular, the theories of self-categorization and social identity. Um, and they basically um, make the point that person's identity of yeah, to, to start differently, there's an individual identity a person adopts and a social identity a person adopts. And this social identity consists of different social groups a person wants to belong to, a person identifies with. And these social groups can be characterized by the same attributes, shared faiths, shared experience, could be a religious group, for instance, um, and, and other groups as well. Um, but it's also important to, um, to realize that group membership is not for granted. It requires the individual to meet certain group norms that we could also call social norms here, which means that people need to show a certain behavior in order to be accepted as a member of these social groups. So this is the, the, yeah, the basis from social psychology. And then Rachel Crenton and George Akerlof uh, use this in order to come up with what they call an, an identity utility function or a utility function that um, has an identity utility component, is augmented by an identity utility component. And it could be written in this way here. So the utility of individual J consists of a standard utility part, uh, which is V here with AJ one's own actions and A minus J the actions of others. Yeah, so in economics, this could be the, the own actions could be consumption of goods and consumption of leisure, for instance, and the actions of others could be externalities. And then there is this identity utility part that also depends on one's own actions and the actions of others. Um, and most crucially, perhaps on the social categories C here, CJ, that people choose and identify with. Um, and the prescriptions P that the individual cannot influence um, and that define the group membership. And then there's also epsilon in the theory, epsilon being some inborn abilities um, that are, um, yeah, the, the, the individual's ability to fulfill these uh, norms, these prescriptions of behavior uh, to some extent uh, depend on. So all of these components can increase or decrease utility and, and thus happiness from, from, from this theoretical point of view. Importantly, the own actions, AJ, must correspond to the prescriptions of the social category. And this will produce this identity utility here according to the theory. So when it comes to working, our theory is that um, we assume that there is a social category 
that we could call the able-bodied members of a society or those in society that contribute to societal welfare, in particular people of working age want to belong to. Yeah. And there are certain social, there are certain prescriptions, of course, certain norms that need to be fulfilled in order to be an accepted member of this social category or social group. And one is the social norm to work, which could be fulfilled by, for instance, volunteering or domestic work, but also by supplying market work. And there's another uh, norm here, and that's the norm to be self-sufficient, or as many sociologists have put it, um, the norm not to live off others, yeah, to be independent of public assistance. And then when we try to, and this is what I will do in the following, the empirical testing of this hypothesis, uh, when I will compare people in work with people out of work, um, then we can consider the case of unemployment and ask, okay, what's the problem here? The problem is that people who are unemployed, they don't uh, obviously don't meet these two norms. Yeah? In particular, they, when they've lost jo their jobs then they don't fulfill the norm to work. And in many cases, they will also be not self-sufficient. And therefore we would expect them to lose identity utility. And now I want to show how this framework can accommodate, as I said in the beginning, uh, many empirical findings. And I start with the study by my co-authors and others here um, uh, from 2010 where they basically compare um, employed people and unemployed people and then their life satisfaction and their experiential well-being, so their affective or emotional well-being. Um, and they use the net effect here to aggregate the different emotions that people experience over the course uh, of the day. And what they find when they uh, compare employed people and long-term unemployed people in this sample is that which is, the, is fairly standard in the literature, this result that the unemployed suffer in terms of life satisfaction. At the same time, however, they do not find that the experiential well-being in employed people is higher than in unemployed people. And this is a first hint, a first uh, result that point, might point to identity utility. Because when it comes to the suffering of the unemployed or put it positively, the benefits of employment, this seems to be something that is in people's mind when they evaluate their life and they think about past achievements and the current state and future goals, perhaps. It's not so much something that affects their daily lives because this we would expect to show in effective well-being as well. And of course, when it comes to people's identity and whether their behavior match the social norms they need to fulfill or whether they think that what they achieve in life um, is, uh, corresponds to their ideal selves, then this is something that is completely cognitive. Now, at least we could make the assumption here that this is something that uh, we would only expect to show in, in cognitive well-being rather than in experiential well-being. It is a stark assumption, but I think it could be seen as a first sign in that direction here. And using more sophisticated identification strategies, as we argue in the handbook chapter, the result by Knabe and co-authors could be confirmed. The second identification strategy is around these norms that need to be fulfilled in order to um, produce identity utility. And here the norm to work in particular, and I would start with the result of Andrew Clark in 2003, who showed that men suffer less from unemployment in areas where the unemployment rate is really high. Yeah? So what these studies exploit is basically, or they, they work on the assumption that the strength of the social norm to work um, crucially depends on the number of people or the share of people that are able to uh, comply with that norm. And then based on that argument, we, we, could, we could say, okay, then it's really the weaker norm to work um, that causes that unemployed people in, in uh, high unemployment areas suffer less from unemployment. Similarly, Stutzer and Lalif exploit a referendum in Switzerland um, where people were asked uh, whether uh, unemployment benefits should be cut. 
and then they show that in areas where people support these cuts in unemployment benefits, the satisfaction of uh, as a negative satisfaction effect of unemployment is particularly strong. Yeah? In areas where people don't support unemployment benefit cuts, it's the other way around. Again, on the, based on the assumption that uh, here the support for unemployment benefits somehow um, reflects the strength of the norm to work. And then there's something that really uh, relates to the previous talk by Olga, um, another excellent study by Van Horn and Marseland here, where they have shown that unemployed people suffer more in Protestant regions. They also suffer more when they are Protestants as compared to other religious groups or atheists or whatever. Yeah. So here we have an example where basically religion plays a negative, not a buffering, a negative role for a life event. Um, uh, in, in this case, a certain religion, and this is uh, Protestantism. And here the assumption is that Protestants have this, this particular, particularly strong work norm because working hard is basically part of their uh, lived faith. So a, a very uh, Calvinist idea of, of Protestantism. All of these results, um, in, in a way, point in, in the direction of identity utility and this mismatch between the norms, uh, the social norms, and uh, what the people, uh, what these unemployed people do, or the match between what employed people do and um, their identity. The final identification strategy um, that I would um, argue here points into that direction of a strong role of identity utility. Uh, when it comes to the difference between working people and involuntary unemployed people is retiring from unemployment. And what we've done here is we have uh, looked at life satisfaction in employed and unemployed people and observed that these unemployed people benefit around the time of retirement, which here is between T minus one and T zero. Um, and what actually happens here is that nothing in the lives of these unemployed people changes. They haven't worked before retirement, they don't work afterwards. Also because they're elderly unemployed workers, they're also not required to search for jobs anymore. And they don't search for jobs uh, to an increasing intent, uh, extent afterwards. Of course, in income doesn't really change and could be controlled for and so on and so forth. So nothing really changes in the daily lives of these people, except that their social category they belong to changes because they are now not members of the, they are not basically of working age anymore. They are, have reached retirement age. And so they switch the social category um, uh, from these able-bodied members of the society that should contribute in some way to the deserved retirees uh, who are not expected to work anymore. And also this result could, um, has been confirmed by a number of, of later studies. And then I said this identity utility framework is, is not very well suited to pinpoint a certain aspect of work that is uh, particularly important. It's more a framework that can accommodate many effects of working or why working might be important to people's well-being. And here it gets a bit more speculative when I talk about other evidence that I think point, point into, in points into the same direction. Uh, and to explain this, I've tweaked the identity utility part of, the, of our utility function a little bit and focused more on these actions of others. Yeah, so we could assume that the actions of others also depend on whether um, an individual um, conforms to the norms, to the prescriptions of their social category. Yeah, so what we would assume here is that, for instance, if a person loses work and um, uh, becomes unemployed, then other people start behaving differently towards that person. Yeah? They're treating that person in a different way. And this is often described as a stigma or stigmatization or treatment stigma. And this is also what we observe in many other empirical studies that are not um, so much talking about well-being and identity, but for instance, show that unemployed people more often feel stigmatized or they refrain from activities in the public, although they have no more time to, um, to spend on leisure activities, they, they do less leisure or fewer leisure activities in the public, and also they experience social exclusion. 
And of course, income could play a role here, but at these studies, it seems, it seems that accounting for income does not explain uh, these effects in, in total, at least. So I hope to show here that the identity, the idea of an identity utility function can, can yeah, be related to you know, a broad range of empirical findings. And this extends to labor market policy. Um, and when we, when we start about thinking, start thinking about labor market policies that um, can help unemployed people, then probably passive labor market policies won't help. So this idea of, you know, the generosity of the unemployment benefits or the social welfare benefits is probably something that can help in many ways um, when it comes to poverty, but not so much when it comes um, to identity utility, because this is basically a non-monetary issue. So we are in the world of active labor market policies then, and here in a broader sense, so not about training and further education, but any job creation scheme would be part of, of this idea of a broad de definition of active labor market policies too. Uh, and I will talk about workfare schemes here and in-work benefits, and again, try to show how identity uh, utility makes a different here, difference here. So the, the basic idea of workfare schemes is a bit of, an, of a nasty one. Uh, it's a kick in the rear of the unemployed. Yeah? So workfare means that people are, unemployed people are required to do unpaid work in order to be able to continue to receive social welfare benefits. And the idea is that unpaid work deprives them of the leisure time they enjoy. And in doing so creates an incentive that they search harder for paid work. Yeah, but in order to have this incentive effect, you would expect people in workfare jobs to show lower well-being than people who are simply unemployed and can enjoy their leisure time in full uh, because this unpaid work, it doesn't make a difference to their income. But when we look into the empirical literature on that, we find that it's, it's probably not working in, in the way that it was intended uh, initially workfare because the, the people on workfare jobs, they report higher levels of well-being, of life satisfaction, for instance, than unemployed people. So it's not that kick in the rear, it's actually something that, um, that they enjoy. And the theory of workfare cannot explain this. But the idea of um, non-monetary functions of employment, of course, uh, Yahoda's latent functions, um, um, having uh, social contacts outside the family, activation, structure in daily life. This can explain this and also the social norm to work can explain this because people cleaning parks and do other unpaid activities um, for non-for-profit organizations, for instance, of course, they in some way contribute to society and fulfill the norm to work. What we also see in these data is even when you know income uh, and other things are controlled for uh, people in workfare jobs they don't catch up with employee and um, regularly employed people and this could be and i speculate here this could be because they are not self-sufficient they still need to receive unemployment benefits or social welfare um, and this is even more um becomes even more obvious in in another um, unemployment policy or labor market policy here, and these are in-work benefit programs. In-work benefit programs try to ensure that a, a person that is poor will always be better off working um, as compared than when they are unemployed. Yeah? So suppose we have an unemployed person and they have the opportunity to, to work a little bit um, a few hours, a job that is unfortunately not sufficient to make a living, uh, but still um, they can supply some hours, then the in-work benefit scheme will always ensure that the social welfare benefits um, are not uh, reduced to the same extent as the person um, has now earnings from labor. Yeah? So there will always be some income in addition that the working um, a person is always better off than an unemployed person, even if that job does not suffice to make a living. 
Uh, and we have looked in, in one of our own studies here at uh, unemployed people that make the transition to a job that is subsidized in that way. And again, in line with the idea of working, fulfilling several non-monetary functions, we find a positive life satisfaction effect, even if you control for income. Yeah, so unemployed people taking up subsidized jobs gain in terms of life satisfaction and they lose uh, when they make the opposite transition and lose subsidized jobs and become unemployed. And then we have also looked at transitions between subsidized employment. So people, again, working what, what is often called the working poor, doing these, these jobs where they still have to uh, receive in work benefits and a more regular job that suffices to make a living. And here we find, again, life satisfaction differences. Yeah, so people make the transition, the same people make the transition from a subsidized job to a regular job from one year to the next. Um, they gain life satisfaction, even if you can con control for um, the income effect and the differences in job characteristics uh, and so on and so forth. So what we believe here is that this is again um, evidence that shows the importance of this norm to be self-sufficient. Yeah, because the only difference that is ideally left in in in, um, in this empirical identification here between the regular job and the subsidized job is um, that uh, uh, the, the those on the subsidized uh, subsidized job they they still need to receive welfare benefits. Um, in, in order to make a living and are therefore not independent of others. Okay, and also this is something that, you know, several other studies um, hint at, uh, and we discussed this in, in our chapter. So when it comes to, to policy implications, uh, we would argue that to restore unemployed workers' identity utility labor market policy should aim at bringing people back into what we could call a regular job, yeah, a, a job that is um, enables people to um, be self-sufficient. Um, what could be done in this regard? Um, we could argue that low-wage earners should not be required to pay taxes or make social security contributions. Yeah, because from the employer's perspective, um, the taxes and the social security contributions they add to the total labor cost. And what could be done here is to reduce these labor costs and there, in, in doing so, increase the demand for, for work uh, of low wage earners. Um, and as this is a, a general policy, something that would you know, apply to everyone, it can also be not stigmatizing or um, you know, be attached to some uh, norm deviation. Um, on the other hand, when we talk about these job creation schemes I, I was mentioning before, we could make the point here that um, they should make the deviation from the norm to be self-sufficient um, less salient. Yeah? So in the case of, for instance, our in-work benefit program, um, these people still have to go to the social security office and apply for social welfare, even though they are employed. And this could be perceived as stigmatizing. Yeah? It also makes very salient the fact that they are not self-reliant. Suppose we um, would have a policy where the same, uh, same subsidy would go to the employer, then of course this could be less salient uh, to the employee who is hired on such a job. Yeah? And there are many concepts, or there exist many concepts since the 1990s uh, of how such, an, such a wage subsidy could, could look like. Okay, so some, to sum this uh, up, I think um, I, I try to show, and we've seen that the identity utility framework helps to rationalize an important non-monetary well-being effect of working and an important reason why people supply work uh, instead of um, you know, spending all of their time watching Netflix and reading books, uh, which is of a non-monetary nature. Yeah? So this is not about consumption of goods, it's about non-monetary reasons of work. And we would say identity is an important part here and can explain a number of empirical findings. Also, we can try to come up with policy implications uh, based on this uh, framework. And then there are directions for future research, of course. 
Uh, first of all, none of these empirical strategies that I talked about um, that in my view show that identity utility plays a role here uh, measure social, social identity or social norms directly. Yeah? All of these approaches in a way are um, in an in indirect way of identifying the effect of, effects of norms or identity. And of course, this could be resolved. Then um, when, when it comes to policy implications, um, the studies uh, we, we rely on currently, and I think this applies to the whole of, you know, the policy effect of effects of labor market, uh, the, no, sorry, the, the well-being effects of labor market policies um, are basically studies um, uh, on, on based on observational data, and we are lacking randomized control trials here. Then I briefly talked about the possible interactions between identity and social norms and stigmatization, but this remains a hypothesis so far. And there could be more empirical work into this um, that would, you know, a really test for these interactions. And finally, all of this evidence uh, we have in this handbook chapter, I think almost all of that is based on uh, norms around working in Western societies. Yeah, and of course, we have to extend this and, and think more about other cultural contexts, and maybe there are other norms that matter um, in, in terms of working here. And of course, in the beginning, I said um, this should not only be about the comparison between work and non work, it should also be um, identity could also be important for for many workers and the job types they do and the occupations they have and of course there should be done more about this beyond this mere idea of you know as i said in the beginning the, that identity utility could could be related to um, why pe certain people do certain jobs okay thank you very much i look forward to your comments thank you for your really interesting and clear presentation wow um, so, if you want to ask a question, you can do it again either via the chat or by raising your virtual hand. Uh, yeah, first we go to Kelsey. Hi, Clemens. Uh, very interesting. Um, so. I'm thinking if maybe people don't understand this uh, and so there may be a difference between uh, decision and experienced utility. Uh, so people maybe when making decisions are focusing on, you know, decision to take a job uh, or not, and perhaps in a different context where there's not uh, the subsidized jobs and maybe they would be losing income by taking a low paying job compared to, uh, you know, the benefits that they might receive. Uh, but they're, they're focusing on the income and not identity. Uh, so uh, see what you think about, about that, uh, maybe decision versus experience utility and making a mistake. Um, well, experience utility doesn't really help when, um, when we want to explain why people work. Yeah, because when we look in the, into these studies on uh, experiential well-being and um, and work and non-work, we basically find that working is one of the, the activities that um, produce the least experiential utility or experienced utility. Uh, so um, following this study by Knabe and others, there are even there have been findings even by other by other researchers who show that you know the unemployed even enjoy higher effective well-being or experienced utility. Um, than the employed. So I think we really have to talk about the, the more the cognitive uh, side of well-being. Um, if, if you look at effective well-being only, then, then this will all be a mistake. Um, and um, therefore, I think it's not, really, it's not really helpful. We don't really, cannot really explain yeah. a lot. Um, Sorry, yeah. These measures. Yeah, I, I misspoke. I, I'm thinking not like experience subjective well-being, but what I really mean is um, you know, somebody's actual evaluation of life satisfaction uh, versus how they expect their life satisfaction to change uh, given a certain uh, choice or activity. So yeah, they're mispredicting perhaps. Yeah, I think, um, 
Uh, I think there's work by, by Reto Odermatt about this, um, where he compares the, what people expect as their life satisfaction in, in five years time. Uh, and then what they, in panel data, what they actually experience is life satisfaction. Uh, and if I remember correctly, at least for self-employed people in a paper with, uh, with others, they can show that um, they, they are over-optimistic uh, regarding the life satisfaction effect of the decision to become self-employed. Uh, right. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, so this, and, and I'm, that's just a, like, you know, let's say background. I wonder to what extent people recognize identity is part of their utility function. So they're focusing on income. They believe that that's the important, the salient factor. And then identity forms an important part as you know, your uh, you know, presentation has illustrated and an important part that people aren't thinking about. So one of the conclusions would be that, you know, we need to help better inform people perhaps uh, about, you know, what it is that makes them happy, you know, in an evaluative uh, context. So you, you would even argue that people don't supply work because they underestimate the, this identity effect. Maybe. Maybe, yeah. Okay, this is um, hard to argue with. Uh, um, I don't know. I mean, there are studies on um, social welfare receipt, for instance, that show that some people or a large fraction of people don't take up social welfare. They don't receive social welfare. They don't ask for it, even though they would be eligible. Um, and this is something that is also, I mean, could also be, explained by, you know, not being informed very well, could also be explained by not wanting to experience the stigmatization or, you know, norm deviation um, of taking up social welfare. So I, th I think many people, um, many people actually take these decisions, but I think that you could do more research into that, yeah, and ask people what that motivates them to, to do work or supply work or, yeah, a certain amount of hours. Thank you. Um, I have a question about um, one of your policy implications, and it's about your suggestion uh, to reduce or remove the taxes on the wage jobs. And it made me wonder why this is not being done in practice, at least not to my uh, knowledge. Um, so is it either the case that maybe the policymakers didn't have the right knowledge yet, or are there more political reasons at play as well, like the fear of attracting more foreigners to the country that might take the jobs, or this yeah. criticism about income, uh, well, from the middle and higher class. So can you reflect on that, why it hasn't been done? Well, I think it's a yes and no. So in terms of taxes, of course, the, the, the lowest, I don't know what it is in the Netherlands, but probably the lowest 10,000 euros or so are exempt from taxes. Yeah? So tax exemptions for um, the, the first couple of thousand dollars or whatever are often exempt from taxes, but not so much when it comes to social security contributions. Yeah? So often from the first euro earned or dollar earned, people have to pay social security contributions. Um, and here there, there, there could be done something about this. Uh, what's often a problem is that um, there are, you know, public, uh, there are budget implications, for instance, of that. Yeah? So if, you, um, if, if people at the lower end of the wage distribution don't need to pay um, taxes and social security contributions anymore, then someone else have, will have to pay this. Um, and then you have to increase the taxes you know, somewhere higher up the wage distribution. Uh, and of course, this creates political economy issues. Um, yeah, so um, <clears throat> I, I, that would be my answer. Yeah, so it's, think about the balanced budget. And, you know, if, if you reduce it at some point, you need to, you need to get more at, at some, somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you would propose not a very rigorous 
shift, but smaller shifts to also make it politically acceptable, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. if I may add, there's a historical. Oh, I'm sorry, Eduardo was was going to ask a question. Okay. Uh, okay. Go ahead, please. Okay, uh, just real brief. Actually, the U.S. considered introducing universal basic income at the end of the 1960s, and uh, to make it more palatable politically, what they did is they changed it to the earned income tax credit. And so it just applies to everyone, but the idea is to reduce this incentive, uh, disincentive to work. And it, it's it, it's similar to what uh, Clemens you're, you're suggesting, but it's not targeted, it's, it's applied to, to everyone, um, not just the low income workers. Uh, but they, they made this change just for make it. I, I think it's very, I think it's, uh, of course, a very important suggestion and something that is often discussed in this, in this context. Uh, and I also think it's very similar because, uh, you know, if you don't have to pay social security contributions for the first 10,000 euros, uh, earned, then this can also be applied to everyone. Yeah, in the tax system, it's applied to everyone. Um, and then, of course, you know those who earn more, they start to to pay more taxes and social security contributions. So it's very similar. It's not just as extreme as you know demanding a, a basic income. Um, it's it's saying that you know you these the, the taxes should not be negative at the lower end of the. Um, of the wage distribution, which would be a basic income, they should be zero at least, and also the social security contributions. Um, so I think is for some perhaps politically more digestible my my solution here or my proposition uh, uh, than the basic income, which is you know um, a heated debate and um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, Eduardo? Hi, Clement. Thank you. Hi. Uh, congratulations for your research uh, with specific facts and specific outputs about our, our, your, uh, your research. I uh, only have a question. Um, what do you think about uh, the unions, unions impact in uh, quality life workers and uh, unions relation with top managers and human resources in a process of quality life. Yeah, I think there is, um, there is what is often called the union job satisfaction puzzle, if you are referring to that. So um, I think the early research on that has shown that um, union members and uh, workers working in, 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 you know, in, uh, in areas where there's union coverage are often less satisfied um, uh, with their jobs at least than in you know, uh, workers working where there's no coverage or non-union members. There is a lot of selection, of course, yeah. So, um, if I work in an, in an environment where I'm really unhappy, then I'm, you know, more likely to found a union with others and, you know, and so on. Absolutely. And uh, there is newer research, I think, by Andy Charlwood and, and um, uh, Alex Bryson, for instance. Um, uh, who, and, and I think th they have done some rigorous uh, empirical research into that and they don't find this puzzling results anymore. Uh, but I would have to check for that. It's not part of it's not part of the the chapter. But I can send you the reference, of course. Okay, thank you. And I'm just reading in the chat that you know Milena says that there is a chapter on union on subjective well-being by um, a very nice colleague by Laszlo Gerke uh, in the handbook of um, yeah human resources, uh, labor, and population economics as well. Maybe we can share that here, uh, Milena. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one more question. So, is there any evidence already on the COVID uh, pandemic in relation to this? I 
to these identity effects of unemployment because now it's more like an exogenous shock and yeah you, some people just happen to work in the wrong sectors let's say in terms of the pandemic so you would expect it to be much smaller this identity effect i guess that would be my hypothesis but is there any evidence on this yeah it's something that um julia schmidtke who's also in, in this in this call here um and i would will want yeah will hopefully look at uh, in the near future um, to, you know, compare the effect of unemployment before and after the pandemic. Um, and then you would expect from an identity perspective that, um, you know, when many people have become un unemployed as well, uh, and that's what you're saying, Martin, then the, then the well-being effect should be smaller. Um, but uh, on the other hand, um, um, others' unemployment always also conveys a signal about your own prospects of finding a new job uh, soon and being employed in the future. And of course, if there's a pandemic and lockdowns and everyone, um, or not everyone, but many people lose their jobs, then you also have a very, very uh, shattered expectation, basically, of being employed um, in the near future again and, and being able to fulfill these social norms um, in, in the future. So therefore, it's not um, it's not clear, uh, and I think we will start from this from these two conflicting hypotheses and try to find something out uh, in the data about this in the future. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, Elena found the link to the yeah, other chapter on unions and well-being. Yeah. Okay, so since we only had two presentations this session, um, yeah, we, uh, the session is over. And I want to thank you for being here. Tomorrow there are four more sessions of the, yeah, organized by the GLO and eHero. So I hope you, to see you there. And uh, well, for people who just want to chat a bit, they can stay and otherwise I wish you Great day. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you. I'm just saying bye. Thank you. And uh, Clemens and Olga, you really did a great job. Great presentations. Yeah. Um, and great uh, chapters in the handbook. Thank you, everyone. I will tune off now. I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. Th thanks see for the opportunity um, to do this, Milena and Martin. It's our pleasure. <clears throat> Can you actually send me uh, your chapter, Clemens? Because I'm, I'm, teaching on this topic as well, on employment and happiness. So it can be really uh, interesting for my teaching. And yeah, I, I, will, I, I, will, I will do so. I will send you this chapter, maybe the one by Nikolai Zupa, which is more, you know, more, you know, more generally about unemployment and well-being. Um, and maybe the one that we, you know, unfortunately didn't hear today about self-employment and well-being could also be interesting mm -hmm. for your for your teaching yeah yeah that would be great um because they're not open access available already or are they the chapters i think they've all been published as glo working papers ah yeah, yeah. ah so in, ah, in exactly the same them. you know version yeah um, yeah mine too yeah yeah oh then uh, i will find them as glo uh, working papers yeah so I have some students uh, reading your work as well <laughs> from my Very university. Very good, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm also doing an economics of well-being class in, um, in, in spring. Oh, cool. And um, yeah, so le let me know how it went. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I already do it for eight years now. Um, so yeah. if you can, I can show you, uh, share some materials. Is it your first time that you teach? It's not my first time. I'm, I think oh, I'm yeah. doing it for the third time or so. I would be interested in like an um, syllabus, like an overview of contents uh, or so to learn a little yeah. bit more about what you, you know, uh, what you consider important. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'll send it to, to you. Yeah. Milena has shared uh, everything what we discussed. Yeah. Let me see. <clears throat> Oka, you're still here? Okay, I say goodbye to Martin. See you tomorrow then. Yes, yes, see you tomorrow. Yeah, I'm downloading all the links. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for, for organizing these sessions. Yeah, no problem. See you tomorrow. Eduardo, you're still here? Hi. Excuse me. Yes, I'm here. Oh. Yeah, it's Good. nice to meet you. I've never uh, met you before. So I'm curious oh. uh, like what you're doing and uh, what type of work. OK. So uh, what type of work uh, do you do? What do you study? Excuse me, uh, I, I don't know uh, who who is our next uh, expositor. Ah, there is no next uh, presenter. This session is over, oh. but I was... Oh. No, excuse me. I'm, I'm a student in this moment. <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay, I, I don't... Uh, uh, my, my intervention uh, was uh, yesterday about resilience in a medical workers hmm. okay. in, hospital. in hospital okay okay very interesting um where do you live in which country monterrey mexico oh uh, i live in monterrey mexico uh, um, near the united states uh, near the the border the border with texas monterrey mm -hmm. is a big big uh, big country of Mexico, industrial yeah, company, yeah, I know, I know. I'm... With, with a different kind of organization. I'm a researcher and, and consulting in organizational psychology. I'm professor okay. in Tecnológico de Monterrey and Universidad Autónoma de Nuevo León. Ah, yeah. Yeah, no, my wife is Mexican. So I, uh, okay. I come every Where year come? in Mexico. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Where come from your, your wife? In Mexico City. Mexico City, very good. Yeah, so every Christmas we go to Mexico. Okay. ¿Ya has aprendido algo? Sí, un poco. Yeah. Oh, lo dijiste, lo dijiste muy claro. Sí, un poco. ¿Verdad? Muy bien. Mucho gusto. Yeah, mucho gusto.